seriously, who does not know this iconic woman? We've all seen this painting, but who really is she? Well, for the longest time, even historians were not sure who this was. Giorgio Vasari, the Renaissance art historian, wrote in his seminal work that she is Lisa Gherardini or Madame Lisa Giacundo, the wife of a Florentine silk merchant. But there was no way to be sure, since da Vinci kept working on it even when he went to France. And you can be sure that Lisa did not accompany him. But does her identity really matter? Spoiler alert, her identity doesn't matter. Even though now we know for sure that it was a portrait of the same Florentine woman Vasari mentioned. But it does matter whether or not you know who this person is. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, polymaths in human history. But why is this his most famous work? Let's take a closer look. Uh, how might one do that? If you go to the Louvre, there's always an army of people wanting to see the painting. I guess a digital copy will have to do. So, here's one. Leonardo was a superstar in Italy, but he also had a reputation for not completing his work. And the Mona Lisa was no exception. He worked on it from 1503 to 1519, the year of his death. It would make sense if it were an epic fresco, but it's a relatively small canvas, which shocks some people. Let's start with the painting's texture. You'll see that the image is quite reflective, the thin glaze conjuring both depth and luminosity. Leonardo applied the paint so thinly and meticulously that he achieved about 30 layers in about 40 millimeters of depth. Then there's the softness of the colors, which he achieved through his Sufato method of soft, heavily shaded modeling. The surfaces and the transitions between different colors blend seamlessly, forming a clean and almost abstract look in places. The perfect example of this is the famous smile. Mona Lisa's enigmatic smile has sparked as many interpretations as there are stars in the sky. Why, you might ask? Because, if you look closely, you'll see that the smile doesn't end at a clear-cut point. It sort of blends in with the rest of her mouth. No clean stroke distinguishes her lips from the skin on the right or left. Now, given that he used thin glaces, sfumato, and the chiaroscuro method, the light blends everything in a haze. Leonardo employed musicians to keep the subject happy, but you can see that the smile comes and goes. Portraiture subjects in the 15th and 16th centuries did not smile. But Leonardo's search for content and distaste of superfluous drama could only be realized through a smile. Compare that with any portrait of the time and you'll find a stark difference. Leonardo was aware of this. He wanted to challenge the contemporary techniques of portraiture. Why else would a painter who could work for courts, dukes, and popes wish to work on the portrait of a Florentine merchant's wife? Historians are not sure, but common sense would point us to the artistic freedom he must have felt. The Renaissance merchant class was almost as wealthy as the nobility, but had to give special attention to their portraits. They often skirted the line, never crossed it. Kings and queens were portrayed in flamboyant, embroidered costumes and lavish jewelry. The merchant classes could easily afford those things. What they could not afford was to give the perception of challenging the status quo. A great example of this attitude is the Arnolfini portrait, on which we've already done a video if you're interested. The Mona Lisa goes perhaps a step further. She does not wear any jewelry, her hair hangs in the simplest of manners, and her clothes are fairly modest. Not only that, she rests her left arm comfortably on the chair. Comfortable in her skin, self-assured, and carefree. Does she embody charisma, grace, innocence, or lucidity? Well, whatever floats your boat. Looking at any portraits from the era, you'll notice a stiffness, an almost aristocratic rigor. But all that is entirely absent here. Another important aspect of 15th and 16th century portraiture is that women exhibit an almost manufactured modesty. Men can often be seen looking at the spectator in a practically intimidating manner, but women tend to look elsewhere. Lisa, on the other hand, directly returns our gaze. And it's not a harsh or rebellious gaze. 
It's the gaze of a person content with herself. But what about our gaze? Our gaze does not just settle on her. We're free to look around or roam around the frame. Everything that surrounds her is also highly unusual for its time. Portraits were usually drawn against plain domestic settings, open skies, simple landscapes, or just pure darkness. In other words, it was often monotonous. But Leonardo, the ever-sharp and ever-conscious artist, was not content with that. He wanted to move the art of portraiture forward. Painting a portrait in front of a landscape was not uncommon, but painting a landscape like this was an incredible deviation from the norm. Here are a few pictures from Leonardo's era. And now this. This is a highly unusual landscape, mainly because it's imaginary, but also because it utilizes something that Leonardo called aerial perspective in his treatise on painting, where he says, and I'm quoting here, colors become weaker in proportion to their distance from the person who was looking at them. Leonardo knew light scattering through dust and moisture makes things seem less saturated. Different layers start to blend into each other with relative ease. The haziness that we find in the glazy strokes of the figure we also see in the background in which the rocks blend into the sea, which in turn blends into the mountains, which ultimately dissolve into the sky. There's imagination, and then there's creative genius. And this painting has both in loads. The latter comes through when you start to see the woman's flowing hair and clothes mirrored in the torrents of the current behind her. The paths wind and the rivers swell as if they're a part of her, as if they're connected to her. Leonardo's diaries are full of hydrodynamic studies. He investigated everything from the curls of one's hair to the movement of the clouds, so he knew what he was doing. But there's another marvelous invention in this painting, and that concerns the horizon. If you haven't already noticed it, you can catch it now. The horizon does not line up, which could be seen as a blasphemous error for its time. But our mind gels the uneven horizon together, creating a vertical movement across the two halves of the painting. The triangular composition that leads our eyes to Mona Lisa's face extrapolates this effect. To achieve this triangular composition, Leonardo painted her in a three-quarter pose. He did not paint her in a standard profile, nor in a full-length pose, which was very common for historical and mythological images. The graceful figure, supplanted with the sensual, undulating curves of the landscapes behind her, cast a serene and calming spell. Some art historians have argued that Leonardo did not need the subject for sitting since the portrait evolved into an ideal. The image that Leonardo portrays here does not exist, and in some ways cannot exist. A low, uneven horizon. But his relentless pursuit of harmony led him down a 17-year path. The painstakingly painted work deserves all the recognition it gets. And it often did. Napoleon hung it in his room. Eminent writers and critics in France admired the work for its forward-thinking techniques and calming presence. Ironically, it became even more famous after an Italian thief stole it in 1911, going from a lauded work to a publicly discussed story. The saga continues to this day, and Mona Lisa is still the most famous painting in the world. Please leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Is the Mona Lisa's fame justified or is it a tad overrated? Have we missed anything crucial about the work? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We'll see you in the next one.